Welcome to Lemonster Access Television. My name is Bob Sedelli of the Lemonster Historical Commission, and I am here today with the Chairman of the Historical Commission, Mr. M. Donald Pimerini. We are here at the studio of the Lemonster Access Television to reminisce about the historic barn at Sholin Farm, which recently was destroyed in a fire. Don, uh, could you begin our uh, interview today by telling us something about the history of the barn? I know it's quite old. Well, uh, Bob, what I had to do is go through our books to see uh, what we have for history of the Sholin Farm. And of course, uh, the sh that hill has a tremendous history. Uh, if we go back far enough, we find that some of the original settlers in, t in uh, Lemonster settled on Chestnut Hill. And at that time in history, that was what it was called. Chestnut Hill. Chestnut Hill. And, and down below uh, the farm, uh, one of the original homes in Lemonster was built and that was by uh, Gershwin Houghton. And that's on the intersection of Hill Street and Pleasant Street. And of course, the other aspect that I should include because I'm on the Historical Commission is that we have uh, an outstanding family known as the Bus family. And the Bus family uh, occupied most of Chestnut Hill, but not the barn and house that I'll be talking about today. And the one thing I'd like to mention about the Bus family is we have in our records at the Commission office a copy of John Buss's diary of his activity in the American Revolution. Very interesting, very interesting uh, diary to read. And uh, just to explain one little aspect of it, he talked about living uh, with General Washington at, the, at Valley Forge and, and the number of Lumminster people that died at Valley Forge. Very interesting. And uh, someday uh, s people should read that diary. Samuel Buss's diary? Uh, John, John Buss's Buss. diary. John, John Buss's Buss. diary. And, and of course, uh, the Buss family uh, went to number six schoolhouse, too. That was a later time in the, history. The original number six schoolhouse. The original number right. six schoolhouse, yes. And of course, number six was a vital, uh, played a vital role in this, uh, at that uh, section Very of Lumminster. Now, to get back to the barn, what I did is I looked up the history of the barn, and I had to uh, go through our records, and I found that uh, Evelyn Hashey, uh, previous chairman of the commission, did a lot of research on it. And same with Sue Gardner, mm -hmm. and she's friends of Sholin Farm. Right. And also Irma Whitney, she lived on Wachusett Street. Right. She did a tremendous amount of research on, on, the, uh, on Chestnut Hill. And of course, uh, I did a little research myself, uh, but uh, not to the extent of Irma or uh, Evelyn or Sue Gardner. But I did find that the original house was uh, built in 1742, uh, and that was the house across the street from the barn. Now, when the barn was built, well, that's another story, because when I looked at the photographs of the house, that was all hand-hewn timbers. Uh, uh, I showed the uh, Jack Sully and uh, Carl Piermarini the um, uh, the structure of the house, and back in 1982, we photographed it, and it it was very obvious it was all handmade. But I also looked at the photographs we have of the interior of the barn. Well, those timbers, though all post and beam were made by a saw, a circular saw. And you can see the lines of the circular saw. So therefore, the circular saw didn't come out maybe until the 1840s. And, and so the house was probably built somewhere on, in the mid-1800s. And the other thing that I came across 
that the barn was built in the 1880s. Of the 1880s. The I'm sorry, the 1850s the or the middle 1800s. And, we, and since the house which existed across the street was the original house, we think, yes. that predated the barn. Oh, yes, by at least 100 years. Right. At least 100 years, the house predated. Right. There may have been a barn before that, ah. but we have to rely on... Uh, on records, and we have to look at the building and see how the building was constructed. The other thing is, uh, when I went through this history, I talked to Sherwin Drury, and I asked him about clapboards and shingles, uh, the cedar shingles or cedar shakes, and he said there were a series of mills in town that produced cedar shakes or cedar shingles. And there was one on Slack Book, Brook, one on Manusnock, one on the Nashua, and then Bartlett's Pond up off of Elm Street. Yes, the Sportsman's Club, the sportsman, location of the That sportsman's pond was built primarily for a water wheel and to produce, it was a sawmill, and it produced uh, shingles. Because cedar shingles were necessary for roof material at that time in history. Uh, if you look in the, the old structures of all the old houses in town, the roof material was made out of cedar shingles. shingles. So I'm sure the slate roof on Shulman uh, Farm, barn, uh, was, came at a later date because that is slate. And slate was a very difficult uh, material to come by in, in, in history. So it was probably in the latter part of the 1800s that they put the slate roof on. Interesting. And uh, two points. First, uh, for the audience to identify Sherwin Drury. He's a very knowledgeable gentleman in town, a member of the Historical Commission, and uh, he has a wealth of knowledge, and we rely on him for lots of information. And I find it interesting, too, that you, you as an historian, when you're mentioning one way that for example, the date of a building is determined by the saw marks on the timbers, uh, so you can make these connections and, and help to date. Uh, so it's sort of like a forensic thing. Uh, uh, sort of like a detective uh, exactly, uh, investigation. Exactly, uh, Bob. When you look at the structure of old buildings, you'll find that they used an instrument called an ads, and that chipped away the timbers. And you can see all these marks. But when you look at a current home, you'll find that there, there is a saw mark, if it's rough timber, or it's planed. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, no such thing occurred in either of the buildings, yeah. you know, right. the, the, the farm or the barn. Uh, they, were, they were very rustic. Uh, but let me, uh, let me tell you some th more things about the barn. I, I'd like to relate to my childhood days. Is that yes, all right yeah, with I, you, Bob? I know you have a connection. You, as a child, you spent a lot of time up in that neck of the woods. Yes, I did. In other words, uh, during the Depression, uh, most kids had to find a job to do. And um, come harvest time in the fall of the year, uh, we would go to the farm, either by bike or, bike or walk. And we would pick apples. Now, that would be in the latter part of the 30s and the 40s and well into the 50s. And, of course, the, the farm at that time in history was owned by Paul C. Washburn. And his overseer was Raymond Woodsmall. Now, I knew his son, Jack. In fact, Jack was here with John yes. Shuri, and we talked about Number 6 Schoolhouse. They attended the Number 6 Schoolhouse, right? Yes, they did. Jack Woodsmall. Well, uh, Jack's dad, uh, Woody, we call him, was a great, great person. And uh, he, used to, he used to ride his horse and check on us as we worked in the, in the apple orchards. And the apple orchards were rather extensive. Uh, thousands of bushels of apples were picked every year. And all, that, those, all those apples had to be stored in the, in the barn or the boxes had to be stored in the barn, so you'll get an idea of what the barn was used for. Prior to my going there, I had no idea what the barn was used for. I, in my time in history, it was just for an orchard. Uh, 
for apples and storage. Storage. For, they, they did have a small section, a cold storage section of the barn, but it was just for a few apples. Most of the apples were stored to the right of the farmhouse. And, and, and then it was stored, uh, was put onto trucks and hauled to Air, Massachusetts, and they had CA storage that was run by the Sullivan brothers. And that's where most of Washburn's apples were sent. Now, what kind of apples did he have? Well, they were old-fashioned apples, not the current ones we have today. They were mostly Max, Macintosh, Red and Yellow Delicious, uh, Baldwin's, uh, some Cortland's, and of course, for the winter apples, Northern Spies. Tell you the truth, Bob, I don't know whether some of these apples exist today. Because when, you, when I go to the orchard today and pick the apples, they're, in, they're entirely different. Mm -hmm. They're what the current people like to eat. Mm -hmm. uh, let me tell you some little vignettes about uh, the orchard, okay, and the barn. Uh, prior to uh, my introduction to Washburn's uh, farm, uh, they had cows, and, and these cows were kept in stalls on, on the first floor, but in order to get into the barn, they had to go up through the cellar, and, and that walkway is still there for the cows to get up into the barn. The ramp. The I, ramp. I had yes. been in the barn years back. Yes. Right? And of course, back. Woody kept his horse in there, too, and, and, but the horse came in by that large door, and they had a, a stall for him way at the end of the barn on the right. And of course, all the kids, and most of us were just kids, uh, loved to play in the barn at lunchtime, especially at lunch. And these kids came from all the neighborhoods in the area. They came from number six school area. They came from the Bowery. And they came from Lincoln Terrace, French Hill, uh, DuPont Viscoloid area. And, and uh, they came usually on weekends. Uh, during the uh, fall time, school was in session. And, and they couldn't work during, the, uh, during school, school session, week. so they worked weekends. So you're probably wondering how in the world did they work them during the day, uh, during the week time. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, there are a lot, number of uh, uh, employees in the city of Leominster that had time off. Well, they would they would go up to help pick apples, too, because it was, there was extra money. And the other little story is uh, they used the P POWs from Fort Devens. Prisoners of War, Prisoners Second, of the war. Second World War. In 1943 and 1944. And they were interesting people to deal with because... Were these the German prisoners? Who were well, I really don't know their nationality. Uh, they were just prisoners, prisoners of war of from war. Europe. Okay. And um, they could have been any nationality. Uh, they did talk among themselves, but I was young and, and I didn't know the language they were talking. Uh, I did realize that they didn't speak Italian uh, because they, <laughs> I, could, I would have understood mm -hmm. that. Uh, so there was, they were from another, another section of, of Europe. Okay. But the interesting thing is, and Jack will verify this, the Dusenhofs, the big trucks, would come up from Fort Evans, and all the uh, prisoners of war would get out, and they knew exactly what they were going to do. They were going to pick apples. And, and the MP on duty, he would go to sleep in the cab <laughs> <laughs> and, ignore, and ignore the prisoners. And, but we, we dealt with the prisoners, and they were very friendly, very friendly people. They, were, they actually enjoyed working out in the open. And they enjoyed the rations that they had from the United States government because they were eating things that some of us hadn't seen for a while. For mm -hmm. instance, chocolate bars, and they smoked cigarettes, and they had coffee, and they had all of nice goodies that some of us were kind of envious about. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that was, a, that's that was interesting. an interesting thing. Don, and, when I, I jotted down when you were talking about the little vignettes, and I, this uh, jogged my memory. Uh, I know you worked at the orchard, and I worked for a short time at the orchard. And uh, one, 
during the summertime or the spring before the apples, uh, before harvest time. And we used to have to thin the apple trees by hand at that time. Uh, this must have been in the near around 1960 or that era, late 50s, 1960 perhaps, uh, maybe a little before that. And the, the apples would, and you know about this because you, are, you know your plants, being a scientist too, and we had the, the apples would uh, be in clusters of three and we would have to manually take two of the apples off so that the one that was left would all the energy would go into that one. And now that's passe because that's done chemically, right? Exactly. Nowadays, they just spray some chemical and so the yeah. apples are thinned uh, chemically. And I also had a short stint uh, picking apples and I wasn't a very good apple picker. <laughs> well, I picked quite a few apples in my time. And uh, if uh, I don't know if it, w it was the same time you picked apples, no, but was, we carried a little ticket with us and uh, when you deposited your uh, apples in the bushel, uh, they, would, they would punch your little ticket. And, and at the end of the day, uh, we would go see uh, Woody, and uh, he would check your ticket, and he would pay you accordingly. And, and that's how, that's, you know, it was a daily basis type thing. That's how my, uh, my familiarity with the barn, I'm sure, uh, came about, because I, I worked up there for mm -hmm. a short time. And well, from what I can recall, now I'm not absolutely accurate on this, Bob, but there must have been anywhere from 50 to 70,000 bushels of apples picked at that time in history. And we picked them in bushels, not these great big bins that they put them in today. And, uh, and these bushels were, well, 40 pounds or so, and we had to load them on a flatbed and bring them out to the barn and then put them onto a truck and then, then they were shipped to air. I, I recall we had a, a ladder that narrowed up at the top and you oh, had yes. to put it into the tree and then we had a, a some sort of a, a it's like a, not a school bag but a pouch that with canvas and straps on it and you'd fill the apples, put them in and then you emptied them into a... By taking out the, the, bo the right, bottom portion right, and, of the bucket. And dump them and then yes. go right back to picking more because yes. you got paid by, I guess, the bushel. I wasn't a very fast apple picker. Uh, apple picker. Well, I, I you know, remember I was probably 13, 14 years old, 15 years old. So uh, it, was, it was good money for me at that time in history. And uh, of course, the other thing is my dad knew Paul C. Washburn. Uh, they used to hunt together. And sometimes my dad would go up and they'd go out hunting together. And, and uh, Paul C. had an uh, English setter. And, uh, and they would go out woodcock hunting together. And sometimes I would tag along because, uh, you know, I was learning how to hunt myself at that time in history. I had a little difficulty with Paul because Paul stuttered. And uh, very few people knew that. And I really couldn't understand him most of the time. And my dad would have to interpret for me, you know, what he would say. But he was, he was a real gentleman of a person. Mr. Real. And he and Woody were great guys. I do remember Woody, he was elderly when I, when I worked up there, and I remember Woody. And there was a trailer, the trailer is still there, but didn't yes. he, in, beyond, beyond the water tower? Right. Uh, which is at this point leaning, and we hope it's going to be uh, yes. refurbished. But the trailer, that's where Woody lived, in, in the midst of the orchard. And uh, I always thought that was a beautiful thing, to, you know, because apple blossom time is beautiful up there. Oh, yes. It certainly is. When you were a child and working there, uh, now the area, there are lots of homes, but it was really very, very, very rural, right? It was, and uh, you didn't, you rode up on your bike. Um, oh, yes. Yeah. I, all the way from Crown Street right. in Lemonster, I used to get on my bike and go as fast as I could all the way up there. And there were a lot of other kids, too, besides say, myself. You, you realize that... Uh, most of the high school kids uh, usually found, uh, or junior high, wanted extra money. And so they used to go weekends. And, uh, but they would get there on their own. I don't think uh, Paul C. or, or, or uh, Woody would go downtown to pick them up. They would get there on their own. And, and I got to know a lot of kids in Lemonster you know, that, uh, that became close friends of mine in, in time.
why didn't the kids work at uh, Burger King and McDonald's? I'm being <laughs> facetious. Th those were non-existent at the time, yes. and so the kids who yes. needed the money uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, would do these uh, work. Exactly. Work. Exactly. It was, a, it was a good way of earning money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I do remember uh, also swimming in Haywood Reservoir. At lunchtime, we, it would be hot in the fall of the year, and we'd uh, and Woody would come by and say, okay, take a break. And we'd all scoot down to Haywood Reservoir, and there's a cliff there. Yes. And we'd all strip down and all go swimming. Of course, there were no women around, so we had a grand time. Now, Haywood is the reservoir that's right behind the orchard. Yes. And it's not mm -hmm. Fallbrook. For the longest time, I thought, you know, you go up Wachusa Street, you look and you see a reservoir, and you just assume... But there's actually, May Street is between the two reservoirs, and Fallbrook, belongs, Fallbrook Reservoir belongs to Lemonster. And can you tell us something about Haywood? Haywood, Haywood is part of the Wikipiki uh, watershed system. And uh, I would say back in the turn of the century, uh, Clinton bought up all that land. It would be all of Haywood and all of the Wikipiki uh, reservoirs that are all in Sterling, and they are not used as a source of water for Clinton. Uh, they're just reserve reservoirs. And so it's a, it's a little, it can be a little bit confusing. The, the reservoirs, uh, Haywood and the Wikipiki, they're in Sterling, but they belong to Clinton. They're yes, part of they the Clinton. Do. Yeah, it's part uh, of the Clinton interesting. Uh, water and, system. And that yes. water, does that water eventually flow into the Wachusett Reservoir? Is it, and it empties actually into the uh, uh, Nashua River. Nashua River. Mm -hmm. okay. And that would be the uh, south branch of the Nashua, Nashua River, River, I'm sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, some other... Uh, uh, vignettes about uh, the the uh, area. Now, but before we go into that, I, I have a question. And uh, um, the house, the original house up there, uh, hasn't been there for years. And you you you, ref you made reference to it with the hand-hewn timbers. And uh, the, did you mention about the, the, the huge fireplace? Which no, we do. We did take photographs, Bob. Uh, back in, eight, in the early 80s, uh, when the house was being removed, uh, there was a fire in it, a very small fire. And, uh, and I guess the owner at that time was either Pasek, and I'm sure it probably was Pasek, and he decided to have it uh, removed. And uh, a person came, I don't know where he was from, we don't have that history, and the building was taken down piece by piece because it was all uh, post and beam, and it was removed. Uh, having uh, being a build, building built in 1724, uh, no 1742, uh, made it quite unique. So someone saw the value of having an old house like this. So they they disassembled it and reassembled it someplace else. But the interior, I have photographs of the interior of the building, extremely fascinating because it had a central core uh, fireplace system and, and it was rather extensive. Uh, it must have been at least 10 feet by 10 feet, just the core of the, uh, the middle of the structure. And once the building was removed, I th I'm sure that all the brick and the uh, underpinning is buried under the dirt yeah, on, the site. on the same site. But the building itself was disassembled and reassembled someplace else. And, we and don't we're not aware. sure. Well, we could take this opportunity since we're at the uh, Lemonster Access Television. If anyone in the audience knows where this building at the Sholem Farms, the, the farmhouse itself was uh, reassembled, we would very much appreciate that information. If they could contact the uh, Lemonster Historical Commission, we would appreciate that. That would be great. Um, the I would like to recognize the present uh, people that are working on the Sholin. Is that all right yeah, with you? Yeah, very much so, yes. 
Well, it must be understood, Bob, that the commission is very interested, but there are some other groups of people in town that are more so than what we are. And that, of course, is the mayor. Uh, the, the, in 2000 or thereabouts, uh, the acquisition of uh, the Sholin Farm was, a, uh, was carried out. And then there were a group of people that suddenly came, came as a helping force. And they are known as the, uh, Sholin the Friends right. of Sholin Farms. And the chairperson of that, current chairperson, is Joanne Donato. And she's doing a marvelous job. In fact, this weekend, they're going to have a Blossom Festival at the Apple Sholin Blossom Farm Festival. Orchards. There are some other organizations, too, that are, are played a role in acquisition of the property. And that is uh, the uh, Lummis Land Trust uh, with Peter Bavenzi and Peter Angelini. And then there's also the Trustees of Reservations. The, the director is Dick O'Brien. So all these people have played a role in, in uh, carrying out the... Uh, the future will will carry out the future of Sholin Farms. That's th great. Things can be accomplished when people oh, work I'm hoping, together. Oh, I'm hoping. I'm yes. hoping. Uh, I'm not going to guess what's going to happen, but I'm sure with that the group of people that are working on it, something good will come of it. Uh, before we conclude this interview, Don, uh, which is. Uh, has been, uh, from my point of view, I'm interesting. Um, do, do you have anything else you'd like to say about the barn itself? I, I you know, I, I drove up there and uh, it's different. You know, you're so used to all my life, you know, uh, it's been there and all your life and uh, citizens of Lemonster actually, uh, anybody who's alive and is watching, the barn was there. Uh, and it, uh, it's different, you know. It, it, it certainly is. Is you, there anything else you'd like to well, say? Well, if, if, uh, just to further what you're saying, Bob, you, you drive up from number six, you go by uh, Bob Reagan's house, and then you look up and you expect to see the barn. And, and that, was, that was the centerpiece of, of the whole orchard. This, here's this barn, this great, big, beautiful barn, and it's not there. And, it, it, and for Lummister residents, it, it really hurts n not to see it there. If things work out well, well, and there's enough money, Bob, I'm sure that they will replicate or duplicate the barn. Whether it's uh, bringing in a new one uh, or building a new one, uh, but I would certainly like to see something similar. Uh, I wouldn't, the residents of Lummis would not like to see just a makeshift uh, building put up right. in the place of it. Right. Uh, a lot of money has put into Sholin Farm. There's been a lot of effort on a lot of people, and we would like to see it continue in the right vein. Well, I think this is the ideal place to end the interview. I, I concur with you. The the positive attitude of the friends of uh, Sholen Farm and many other individuals, uh, they will not be deterred. Uh, their determination, their dedication, and their positive attitude, uh, a, an appropriate structure will be built uh, Oh, I on hope that you're site. right, Bob. I hope you're right. Okay, thanks, Don. I, I want to thank you, Don, and I want to thank Kyle Pimerini and Jack Sully and the facilities of the Lemonster Access Television for allowing us, again, to share this historical information with the citizens of Lemonster present.